Okay, let's get to the sermon. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'll be preaching the same thing I preached on Sunday. Nah, just some of the leftovers that I had from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Unfortunately, um, my printer's run out of toner, so I've got to use my computer again, so I hope that's okay. Uh, let's have a look here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and the title of the message tonight is Call Upon the Name of the Lord. Call Upon the Name of the Lord. If you noticed what we read in Romans chapter 10, it had mentioned there a few times about calling upon the name of the Lord. The title is Call Upon the Name of the Lord. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Pay attention to verse number 2. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that are in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Okay, so what do we see? This letter was written to the church in Corinth. We know that. That's why it's called Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. But it's not just written to the saints. It's not just, well, it is written to all the saints. It's not just written to that one church. It's written to all that in every place, not just Corinth, Corinthians, not just Corinth, in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay? The first thing I want you to notice, it's for all saints. Okay? What are the saints? Okay, if you've come from a Roman Catholic background, they'll tell you that the saints are these special Christians. They'll tell you that the high, mighty, and exalted Christians who had performed many miracles in their lifetime or miracles after their death somehow. Right? They'll call these people the saints. They'll idolize them. They'll worship. Some of them sometimes in some, you know, the Catholics will pray to certain saints. You know, um, my wife was telling me, I think her, one, once she had a pet dog and the dog was sick and she prayed to the saints of the animals to look after the dog, right? The saints of this, the saints of that. You want to get your answer, your prayers answered, you know, God's overwhelmed with all these requests. That's why these saints step in and can cover these other requests. Not so. That's not what a saint is, okay? The Bible says here, that a saint is one that is sanctified in Christ Jesus. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. The word saint comes from sanctification. It comes from sanctified. What does it mean to be sanctified? It means to be set apart. It means to be holy. Once you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, you've been set apart by God. You've been made holy for His work. Okay? Now, for some reason, our world has this upside down. We like to use the word Christians. We like to use the word Christians as the main term for believers. But really the word Christian in the Bible only appears three times. And every time it's, it's, it's about those that are just like Christ. It's about those that are walking after Christ. It's about those that seem to reflect Jesus Christ. In fact, if we're going to use a term that exalts a believer, Christian's probably the better term because you're saying you're Christ-like. Saint is the general term. We've all been made sanctified because of Christ, right? And we're Christians because we follow Christ. Okay, so I just want to point out that difference in the world we have today. We want to be as biblical as possible. You know, it's fine to call one another saints. There's nothing to be embarrassed about that. We're not exalting ourselves when we say we're saints. We're saying we're sanctified by His sacrifice. We're sanctified by His blood. Now, I want to talk to you guys about calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, I truly believe this is a sermon that the Lord wants me to preach. Okay? I truly believe that. Um, every sermon I've preached, of course, the Lord wants me to preach it because it comes from His Word. Okay? If it comes from His Word, the Lord wants you to preach it. But sometimes as a preacher, especially when you're preaching often, week in, week out, there are some sermons that come to you that you don't want to preach. There are some sermons that come to you that you don't even think about day in, day out, but then you realize, I've got to preach on this. And that's when I realized it's of the Lord. I realized that's when the Lord has pressed something upon me, something that I really don't want to preach about. I'm not really that interested in. I don't think maybe it's necessarily that important, important at this point in time. But the Lord's put this upon my heart. Right? I had prepared some notes for Sunday. I realized I had to set this aside. Then we visited a church on Sunday night. This was mentioned as well. Then I think on Monday or Tuesday, I can't remember which day, I got a call from a friend asking me about this question as well. So I'm like, okay, Lord, you want me to preach about it? I'm going to have to add a bit more meat to the bone there and, and preach a little more in depth, in depth about calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, what do I mean by calling upon the name of the Lord? This is what I mean. 
once someone has understood the gospel, okay, once someone has believed and understood Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection is my way of salvation, then we as soul winners ought to encourage that person to call, to pray, to thank God verbally with their mouth and acknowledge their Saviour, acknowledge Him by His name, acknowledge the Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord is basically praying, speaking to the Lord. We ought to encourage that behaviour to that person. Okay, That's what I mean by calling upon the name of the Lord at this point in time. Now, some people are against calling upon the name of the Lord, right? And I, I actually think these people are well-intended. They have good intentions. They've understood the Scriptures in a certain way, and they think, well, that's an unnecessary step. There's no need to call upon the name of the Lord. Some people go even as far as saying, well, calling upon the name of the Lord must be a work because they separate it from believing on Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you, tell you three reasons that I could think, think of why people give this a bad... Uh, uh, Reflect on it in a bad way, in a negative way. I'll give you three reasons. Now again, this is not a sermon I really wanted to preach because it's not something that I've ever really thought about. You know, sometimes you, know, you go about life as a Christian, you read your Bible, you're interested in certain doctrines, you don't think about certain things until someone starts asking that question. You're like, where, where, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, you, you don't think about it and then you realize, well, maybe other people do think about it, so maybe it needs to be preached on. The first thing is, people are against calling upon the name of the Lord, praying to the Lord for their salvation because they've heard people say they're saved because they prayed a prayer. And I've met people like that. You ask them, how can you be sure you know, that you're saved? They say, well, I'm saved because I prayed the sinner's prayer. I prayed some prayer. Now, is that how you get saved? Do you get saved because you've prayed a prayer? It's wrong. Because your faith, when you say that, your faith is in a prayer. No, your faith ought to be on the person you're praying to, right? It's not the prayer, it's the one you're praying to. Your faith is upon the object of that prayer, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I get concerned, just like anybody else, if someone says, yep, I'm saved because I prayed a prayer. Then you, don't, you just have totally not recognized, I don't know what prayer you prayed. Did you pray to Buddha? Did you pray to Allah? Did you, what did you pray? I mean, did you pray the rosary? Is that the prayer you prayed? You know, you're not giving me any information. So yes... I can understand why someone is, and I'm against it. I understand why someone's against it if they're concerned that people are basing their salvation on their prayer rather than the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I understand that, okay? The second reason, and by the way, am I against the sinner's prayer? Obviously not. That's what I'm preaching about, calling upon the name of the Lord. All my children that have been led to the Lord that are saved, they've all believed the gospel and they've all called upon the name of the Lord. They've all said something to the Lord along the lines of, you know, please save me. Just something along those lines, okay? But if you ask them, if you ask them right now, you know, why do you believe you're saved? They're going to tell you because I've trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ. I've believed on his death, burial, and resurrection. They understand that the emphasis is on Christ. They understand the emphasis is their faith on Christ, even though they've prayed the prayer. Okay, so I, I, I understand why people can be against, you know, praying the prayer if the emphasis is on the prayer for salvation. The second reason why people might be against calling upon the name of the Lord is because there are, I've never met anyone like this. I've never gone soul winning with anyone like this. But I have been told that there are certain Christians that go door to door soul winning and instead of explaining the gospel, it'll be like this. You know, sir, do you believe you're going to heaven or would you have some doubts? Oh, I have some doubts. All right, sir, pray this prayer after me and you can be sure of heaven. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Right? Some people call that quick prayerism. Quick prayerism. Just get them to say this prayer and, and, and um, you know, say they're saved. So you can go back to your church and say, well, I got someone saved today. I'm against that. Okay? I am against forcing someone or making someone say some prayer, some vain repetition that means nothing when they haven't understood the gospel, when they haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I can understand that is a, a negative reflection upon calling upon the name of the Lord. But here's the thing. There are churches like us, we don't do this in our church, right? We make sure, we spend time with the person so they understand the gospel. We spend time so they understand that it's not of works, that it's based on the work of Christ, on his sacrifice, right? Once they've understood it, and we have the confidence that they've understood it, we then invite them there to pray, 
to call upon the name of the Lord, right? Once they've understood it. And even then, when someone says, yes, I'd like to pray, I always make sure and I tell them, it's not magic words. I don't want you to think you're saying some magic, repetitive words. It's about what you believe in your heart and you're just expressing that to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're just expressing that to, the, to God through your mouth. You're talking to Him. You're calling upon the name of the Lord. So they, can, so they realize, yeah, afterwards they understand, yeah, it's, still, I'm, it's my faith on Christ that saves me, right? Not my magic prayer that I said, right? Trusting in some repetition. But here's the thing. There are churches... Okay, there are independent, fundamental Baptist churches that would look at a church like ours and say, well, they teach quick prayerism. Right? They go door to door. You know, we rejoice in the salvations and we're very conservative with our salvations. Right? We're very conservative. We make sure that person has fully understood. But they'll look at us and say, well, that church, they're just getting them to say some prayer. And that's very offensive. It's very offensive to be accused of just getting someone to pray some prayer when that's not what we do. When they don't know that's what we do, but they say that, that's, I'm not, look, I'm not sure if someone has ever said that about this church, but I know pastors have said that about my former church. Or all they do is go out and make people say some, say some prayer. They've never come to our church. They've never gone door knocking with us. They just, they're just false accusations, right? And shame on them because there are people in their church that will say, yeah, that door-to-door stuff doesn't work. All they do is make them say some prayer. Shame on them because they're going to discourage other Christians from going and preaching the gospel because they think, yeah, this is just a sham. It's a waste of nothing. All right? So I, look, I'm against both of those things. I'm against someone trusting in a prayer. That's all, not Christ to save them. And I'm against people just trying to get people to repeat some prayer. In fact, I would go as far as saying that's another gospel. That's a false gospel to teach people they can just be saved by some, repeating some prayer without understanding the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And if there's anyone in this church that does that, you're getting kicked out because that's another gospel. Thank God no one does that, right? But I'm just, just saying to you, if that's what people do, that is another gospel. It's not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The third reason why people are against calling upon the name of the Lord for salvation, I believe, is because they equate it with work. They say, well, calling, saying something to God is a work. And we know that salvation is not of works. Turn to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Now, for those that have said to me, and there's not been many people, but for those that have said to me that it's, you know, it isn't calling a work. And look, they're just asking the question, okay? They're just asking. I'm not saying these guys are heretics. They just want to grow in knowledge, okay? Sometimes as leaders, as pastors, you know, someone generally just wants to ask a question. You think you're being challenged and then you accuse them of, you know, no. Nah. You know, sometimes people have genuine questions and want the questions answered, right? This is a genuine question that I've heard. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Let's read it. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Um, Epaphras who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salute of you, always laboring. What's laboring? Working, right? Doing a work. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, this is the only verse that I could think of that has some relation of prayer as a work. And I actually believe that as a believer, when you pray, when you intercede for other people, you are in fact working. I actually believe that. Right there we see it, the laboring fervently in prayers. Okay, we don't need to twist the scriptures. Prayer for a believer is work. But let me ask you a few questions. Is Epaphras asking for the gift of salvation here? No. Is Epaphras even praying for himself? No, he's laboring fervently for other people, for uh, the church in uh, Col- the Colossian church. Is Epaphras a saved man or an unsaved man? He's a saved man. Right? He has the Spirit. Think about that now. Is prayer physically demanding on your body or is it demanding on your spirit? Think about it. Is prayer a spiritual work or is it a physical work? It's a spiritual work, right? You're praying in the Spirit. Okay? You're praying in the Spirit. It is a spiritual work. So the man who is unsaved and says to God, save me, is he working in the spirit? First of all, no. He hasn't been even born, he hasn't even been born again. Okay? First thing. And some people say, well, what about Jesus? When he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't he sweat great drops of, of, uh, of blood, as of blood or whatever it says? 
Well, Jesus wasn't sweating because his prayer was that late, you know. He was sweating because of the crucifixion. He was concerned about dying on the cross and going through that. That's why he was praying. In fact, it was his prayer that comforted him. It was his prayer that encouraged him, right? So I don't believe you can take this passage of a saved believer who's not even praying for salvation, who's interceding for a church and is working in the Spirit, laboring in the Spirit, and then equate that to a man who's asking the Lord for salvation. I don't, I, that's, like, that's comparing apples with oranges. You're not even comparing the same thing. So I do not accept that Colossians 4.12 proves that calling upon the name of the Lord for salvation is work. It's got nothing to do with salvation. I don't believe it can be proved for anything. Now turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 verse 7. John chapter 4 verse 7. Because is calling upon the name of the Lord a work? Is asking the Lord for salvation? Or just telling God, I received the gift of salvation. Is this a work? John chapter 4 verse 7. John chapter 4 verse 7. The story of the woman in Samaria, the woman at the well. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Verse 8. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now the key thing that I want you to focus on is here in verse number 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God. What is Jesus offering this Samaritan woman? To work? Or is he offering a gift? He's offering the gift. You guys got so winning? You know when we explain the gift of God, we explain that gifts are free. Okay? If there's any work, if there's any money transaction, it's no longer a gift. Right? Because they're working for it. Gifts are free. Jesus is saying, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that saved to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Is asking Jesus for eternal life, for living water, a work? It cannot be a work because it's the gift of God, Jesus says, right? And if Jesus says calling and asking, however you want to term that, praying, calling, asking, if Jesus is saying that is a work, I mean, if we're saying that is a work, we're not aligned with Jesus Christ. Jesus is not saying that this is a work. Opening your mouth, acknowledging God. How can that be a work? What are you doing? You just, God, please save me. Gifts are free without works. Does Jesus equate asking for salvation as a work? No. Okay, again, if you're equating asking as work, then you're not aligned with Jesus Christ. Or you're saying that Jesus Christ is saying you've got to work for your gift. There's no way around it. There's no way around that. And that's not the only one. I'll just read to you Luke 23, 42. The thief on the cross. I love the thief on the cross. I've said it before. And he said unto Jesus, what did the thief say to Jesus? Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What did the thief ask for? To be remembered. Is he, does he seem like he really fully understands everything? Is he the most educated man in the scriptures? Not really, but he says what he knows. Right? He recognizes that Christ is dying on the cross. He says, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So he must have known that Christ was going to be resurrected to have this kingdom that he's going into. And he says, come, you know, can I be part of that? Jesus says, verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Did Jesus, Jesus say, hold on, you're working for it because you're asking me for it. You know, just, no, don't ask, right? No, it's fine. Asking is just fine. It's not a work. Okay, what about the publican? You know, the publican and the um, Pharisee praying in the temple. Luke 18, verse 13, I'll just read it. And the publican, pub, uh, the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what he said. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's asking the Lord. He's calling upon the Lord. I tell you, Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. So do we have examples in the Bible where people call on the Lord for salvation? Asking for it. Yes, we do. Does Jesus say to work? 
No, he still calls it a gift. Should we have a problem with people praying a prayer for salvation? No. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know what the controversy is. I don't understand. I don't want to preach this. I'm just being honest with you guys. I, I don't get it. I don't get the controversy. I hope there's no controversy in this church. Right? I don't get the controversy. I'm not preaching this because I think there's a controversy in this church. I just, like, honestly, I just think the Lord has laid this upon my heart and wants me to preach this. I don't know, just in case we get accused of, you know, saying something like that. I don't know. <coughs> now, why I think, now I don't know because I'm not one of these people, but why do I think some people think calling upon the name of the Lord is a work? Right? Because they're saying it's a work or it's, it's like borderline works, whatever that means, you know, if it's, it's a work or not, you know. Um, this is why I, I think, and this is what I think people struggle to understand. <sighs> think of the repent, like, we know this very, very well, repenting of your sins. We know, like, we believe, right? We believe, we believe in repentance. We believe you must repent from your false belief, wherever your faith is. When we talk about repentance for salvation, we're talking about your faith. We're talking about repenting or changing where your faith is at. Is the faith in false works? Uh, sorry, false, false uh, religions? Is it upon dead works? Is it just not upon Christ whatsoever? Okay? When we talk about repentance, we're talking about changing that faith onto Christ. Right? So when we say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are automatically in that saying, you've got to turn from your false faith, false belief. And that faith needs to be transferred onto Christ. To us, it's the one step, right? To us, it's the one step. We've believed on Christ, and because we've believed on Christ, we have automatically believed uh, not the things that we used to believe, okay? It's one step. But then there are those that teach you, no, that repentance is not your faith. Your repentance is in your works. You need to turn from your bad works and start doing your good works in order to be saved and they say it's a separate step from believing. A separate step, right? You guys have heard probably Ray Comfort say, you know, you've got to live holy, you've got to turn from your drunkenness, you've got to turn from your fornication, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? What are they, what's the mistake they make? They make it a two-step process. Believing is not enough, you also have to do the works to justify yourself before the Lord. Okay? Now, we would look at someone like that and go, you've got it messed up. You're creating two steps. That's why you're adding works to the gospel, right? And we say, no, it's one step. It's believing and believing. Within that believing, it also means you've changed your false beliefs because you've put it all on Christ. Let me put it to you this way as well. With the calling upon the name of the Lord, those that say that it's of works have done the same mistake. They've now separated the works away from believing. They've said, well, hold on. Is it just, you know, it's the Bible, because the Bible does emphasize belief. The Bible does emphasize faith. And they're like saying, well, there's that, but now you're saying you've also got to say something. And they separate it. They make it a separate step. Like, okay, I've believed, but now that's not enough. I now need to say these words. No, that's not what we believe. We don't believe it's some separate step away from faith. And because they think it's a separate step from faith, they then say, well, that is probably works then, because it's not a faith. I hope that kind of makes sense to you. And I don't know, I don't because I, I ha I've had part conversation about this. I don't fully understand why they say it's works, um, but I think that's their reasoning. I think their reasoning is that it's a separate step away from faith. It's a separate step away from belief. Whereas I say to you, Calling upon the name of the Lord is the expression of your faith. It still is your faith. We're not doing anything other than, where is your faith? It's on Jesus Christ. And then you express that faith to Christ. Is that unreasonable? Is it unreasonable to say, Jesus, I believe on you. You know, I'm not saying you need to say exactly what our church track says, but there must be some acknowledgement. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Be merciful to me, a sinner, as long as you believe the gospel. You know, you're confessing that with your mouth. Is it unreasonable for us as soul winners to ask that from people? 
And let me, let me tell you this, there's been times where I've, not, I've knocked doors, I've explained the gospel, they've understood the gospel, they've told me they believe that, but then they don't want to pray. They don't want to ask the Lord, they don't want to acknowledge God. I say, well, I don't know if they really believe then. I mean, look, from a human perspective, they've told me they believe, I can believe them, but I do not understand why they cannot acknowledge that to the Lord. All right? I'll give you one, another example. I was out soul winning, woman said, yep, I believe, I believe, all that. And then uh, we got to the, you know, she wanted to pray with me. You know, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I deserve hell, and I, uh, no. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Do you, and then I had to stop. I'm like, hold on. Can, do, you, do you recognize that without the Lord Jesus Christ, you were dead in trespasses and sin and you were on your way to hell? She goes, no, no. You know? And it's like, well, hold on. You know, I did my best to carry on and explain it once again and then we prayed it again. But again, she refused. You know, now look. Could she have truly believed? I'm, maybe, right? But just her lack of wanting to even say to God that, you know, I'm a sinner and I deserve it, she wouldn't acknowledge that. It's like she, she and because the other thing was, she kept saying to me, I'm already saved, I already believe all this. Yeah, but you, she didn't believe all that, right? So I didn't put her down as saved. Even though she ended up saying the words with me, I realized she was really struggling to acknowledge her sin before God. So if you don't acknowledge your sin before the Lord, then what's the point of a savior? Do you understand what you're doing, right? There's been other times I've, I've prayed, you know, we got into the point, there's another lady I'm thinking of, we, we prayed together, and the whole thing went well. The only thing is, she was laughing through the whole thing. She was laughing through the whole gospel presentation. She was laughing through the whole prayer. Ha ha ha, giggling. And I'm doing my best, because, you know, she's letting me talk, so I'm preaching the gospel. But she prayed, and then me and my son and partner said, look, I, I don't know, I mean, was she just giggling? Was she just making fun of us, or... You know, did she just have a social problem? And maybe, I don't know. We, we don't know. We want Marker saved. Now look, she could well, very well be saved. I'm not saying she's not saved. All I'm saying is, if we have some doubt, I don't want to count that as a salvation. I'd rather be conservative with the, the, the numbers of salvations that we talk. I'd rather go to heaven and say, Lord, you know, we got 500 people saved during the church, you know, and the Lord says, no, 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 it was 2,000 or something. I'd rather that happen then, Lord, you know, we got 2,000 saved. Uh, no, it was 50. <laughs> you, know? you know, look, the numbers are there just to encourage us, just to get us motivated. And I just, you know, sometimes, I, I'm not saying anyone in this church, I'm just saying, I think sometimes just people just want to get the numbers so they can glory in themselves. Look what I did. Look what I achieved. Okay? I don't want to be a church like that. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We read from the book of Romans and... I've gone off my, I've gone off track a little bit, so, sorry. <laughs> Go to Romans 10. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 12:34 while you while you turn there. Matthew 12:34. The second part of it says, "Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh." Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. More often than not, what the person says out of the mouth reflects what's in their heart. If you ask someone, "What do you what do you believe someone has to do to be saved?" Oh, you got to be a good person. Guess they said that out of their mouth. That's what they truly believe, right? If someone says, oh, it's believing on the Lord. Today we had, to Matt, we had someone that was already saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Cannot, it cannot be lost. We didn't lead him to say that. He said it. That means he believes it. That's coming out of him, right? We didn't make him say those words. He was already saved. Praise God that there are already people saved here on the Sunshine Coast. But uh, Romans 10, verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9. I just want to show you just how related, it's not separate, just how related it is, confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus, calling upon the name of the Lord, is with believing in the heart. It, the two things go together. Verse number nine, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now notice verse 10, what's first? The heart believes, then the mouth confesses. But look at verse number 9. Confessing with the mouth and believing with the heart. Do you see how God puts one and then the other one, then he says, oh, well, it's going to be that way as well. The, it goes together. It's not like it's a separate step. These two things are the same. You know, if you say to me, Kevin, I don't know if I, you know, I believe the gospel. I don't know if I ever, you know, I don't remember calling upon the name of the Lord. I don't remember what I said. 
Look, I find it impossible to believe, impossible to believe that you can understand the gospel, be fully trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've never once said to the Lord, thank you, Lord, for the salvation you've given me. You never once said to the Lord, please save me. You never once said to the Lord, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. There must have been something, right? I'm not saying it may have been immediately or whatever, but there must be some acknowledgement with the mouth, and I actually believe that acknowledgement can be from the heart as well, okay? Because some people might just pray quietly. The Lord hears our thoughts and our, uh, the words from our heart as well, but more often than not, for the soul winner, you know, we're talking to someone, you know, 99.9% .9 of people have a mouth, right? They can speak. And so, you know, the expectation is that they would say something to the Lord. They can lie to you. It's much harder for people to lie to the Lord than to lie to you, okay? Those two things, confessing your mouth, believing... Because here's the thing. For some people, the moment they confess with their mouth is the moment they've truly believed. Okay? For some people, I've believed it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And for some other people, I'm, I truly, when they're saying it, that's when they yes, Lord, I'm acknowledging you. I want you to you know, impute that righteousness of Christ upon me. That I'm truly believing that. You know, I don't know at what point. I'm not a, you know, these are matters of the heart. These are matters of the spirit. These are things that we cannot see outside. But what can we see and what can we hear? The confessing of the Lord, the calling upon the name of the Lord. Look at verse 11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. What are we talking about? Salvation! Believing with the heart, confessing with your mouth. This is not confused. This shouldn't be confusing. That's why I said, I don't want to preach this because I didn't think I'd have to preach this. Okay? The Lord wants me to preach this. Verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Okay? I won't go into all of that, but I just want to show you that calling... Verse, what verse 14, um, uh, um, what verse 14 helps establish is that calling, you might, in, in order for you to call, you have to believe, right? And, you know, like I said, there are those that just, or just call, just repeat this prayer and you're saved. Well, not, they haven't believed. How shall I call on him in whom they have not believed? Okay, so that, that's what I'm saying to you. It's another gospel, those that force people to say some prayer without first explaining and expounding the gospel to that person. Turn to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. Psalm 116. <clears throat> Is this a New Testament teaching? Is this some New Testament teaching? Is this a new teaching? Or is calling upon the name of the Lord for salvation always been the teaching? From the Old Testament to the New Testament. Just to show you here in, in Psalms 116 verse 1. Now look, let me just confess something to you. I got saved at an early age. I don't remember what I said. I don't remember what I said, but I know what I believe. Okay, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. I'm only trusting Him for my, my way to heaven, not my works, not my performance, not my church, not that I'm a pastor of a church, none of those things, right? I know what I believe, and so whatever I said reflected that belief, right? Even if I just said, be merciful to me you know, a filthy sinner, whatever it is. Or even if it just was expressed from my heart to the Lord. Whatever it was, I called upon the name of the Lord. And again, I just cannot understand why people make this an issue. I don't, it's a, it's a work or I just, I don't understand. I, I, I almost feel like people just have too much time on their hands. You know, there's many battles to fight. There's lots of wars to fight as a Christian. And like we try to find any other thing to fight about and argue about. I don't, I don't really get it. Psalm 116 verse 1. The psalmist says, I love the Lord because he have heard my voice and my supplications. What are supplications? Your prayers, your requests. He says, I love the Lord. I love him. He hears me. He hears my prayers. Verse 2. Because he have inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. As long as I live, for my whole life I'm going to call upon Him. Now this brings us to an interesting point. Because is, you know, when we get saved and we call upon them, the Lord, yes, for salvation, 
But that's not the end of you calling upon the name of the Lord. Your life, for as long as you shall live, ought to be a life that you call or you pray, you bring your supplications before the Lord. Look at verse number 3. Because now he's saying to us that his whole life is calling upon the name of the Lord. When did it begin? When did he start calling upon the name of the Lord? Verse number 3. The sorrows of death can pass me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. This man had a fear of death. This man had a fear of hell. Do you see that he's expressing here in this psalm a point in his life when he was not saved, when he still had the fear of hell in him? Verse number four. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. That's his prayer. That's his prayer. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. That's what he said. Verse 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. He knew that the Lord God will have mercy upon him because of his grace. Because the Lord is gracious. And let me just quickly say this false doctrine of dispensationalism, this age of grace. You know, we're living now in the age of grace. You know, God's grace has finally come upon this world. You know, God's grace wasn't there in the Old Testament. We have God's grace now through Christ. It's a false doctrine. We see here in the Old Testament that this guy that calls upon the name of the Lord recognizes God's grace. He says, gracious is the Lord. He was gracious in the Old Testament and he's gracious in the New Testament. That is our Lord because his mercies are new every morning. The reason why he can be gracious and give us undeserving favor and undeserving love is because he's a merciful God. Old Testament, New Testament, right? Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. He recognizes God's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. Verse number 6. Look at this. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Is he saying I've got to persevere? No, he says he recognizes that God preserves me. God preserves the simple. It's God's preservation. He recognized eternal security. God's going to keep him saved as long as he lives. Eternal security. Not because of his works, but the Lord preserved him. He did not preserve himself. The Lord preserved him. Okay? Verse number 7. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. So he's saying, now look, he's no longer afraid. He's no longer afraid of death no longer afraid of hell. He says, my soul, you can rest. You can rest once again. All right? We're no longer afraid because the Lord hath dealt bountifully with me. Verse 8, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Look at verse number 10. I believed... Therefore have I spoken. What does he speak? He speaks of his faith. He speaks of what he believed. He speaks because he believes. Those two things go hand in hand, right? If we can understand that someone who has genuinely believed has genuinely repented, if that's easy enough for us to understand, why then is it hard to understand that someone who has genuinely spoken, someone who has genuinely called upon them the Lord, has genuinely believed? It's the same thing. It's believing. It's where your faith is at. Right? Your faith was in the wrong place. You repented from that. You recognize, you understand that your faith must be on Christ. You call upon Him. You acknowledge that your faith now is upon Christ. It is faith. Okay? It's not faith on your prayer. It's faith on the person, on the object of who you're calling upon. I really want that to you know, stay in your mind. Okay? When we ask people to call upon the name of the Lord, it's not because we're wanting them to trust their prayer. We want them to trust on the one they're praying to, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Verse 11. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? So now, you know, he, he, what, he's saying, what shall I render to the Lord? What should I do, you know, unto the Lord? There's nothing. Like, he, he's essentially saying, there's nothing that I can do. For all the benefits he gives me, eternal life, eternal security, salvation from hell, salvation from my sins, what can I render? 
He recognizes nothing of myself, right? It's nothing of me. He recognizes nothing that he can bring for his salvation. He cannot save himself. He cannot offer anything for his salvation. Look at verse 13. I will take the cup of salvation. How did he take the cup of salvation? And call upon the name of the Lord. That's how he took the cup of salvation. There's a shift that takes place in verse 14. A shift. He now identifies himself as one of the saints in verse 14. Verse 14, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So, after he's been saved at this point, now following on from his salvation, following on from taking the cup of salvation by calling upon the name of the Lord, he now says that... Um, uh, that he will do the works, basically. That he will do the works and be a blessing toward other believers in the presence of all his people. Right? We're together as a church. We work together. We bless one another. That's basically paying our vows, doing what we need to do for one another in the church. Verse 15. Precious is the sight of the... Sorry. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. What is, uh, he's saying, I'm one of the saints. Right? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. This proves that he counts himself as one of the saved. This proves that he counts himself now one of the saints. Death was once something he feared. Hell was once something he feared. Now he sees his death as precious. Precious in the sight of the Lord. See, do you see how he's changed? How he started and now where he's at. You know, saved, assured of his salvation, now trying to walk the way of the Lord. Verse 16. O oh Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. So he says, Lord, I'm going to thank you. This is my sacrifice to you. Do the works. Thank you. You know, pay my vows to the, in the presence of your people and will call upon the name of the Lord. Notice the same phrase. This man's already saved. And he says, I'm going to thank you, Lord, calling upon your name, calling upon the name of the Lord. And this might be another reason, just come to me now, this might be another reason why people reject calling upon the name of the Lord for salvation. Because there are references here, and there are references of Abraham, where he's called upon the name of the Lord, but he was already saved. Because he believed God and his uh, faith was counted for righteousness. Later on in, Gen in Genesis, he, he builds an altar and calls upon the name of the Lord. Okay, so this might be where people might say, see, I can prove to you that calling upon the name of the Lord is not for salvation because it's done by people who were already saved. Well, that doesn't prove anything. All that proves is that we ought to call upon the name of the Lord all our lives. From the moment we're saved to the moment we go to the grave. Right? We ask the Lord for our prayers. We, we go to Him for our prayers and supplications. We go to Him without request. That's calling upon Him. Okay, that's calling upon the name of the Lord. That might be another reason though. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. I don't know. Verse 18, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of the old Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. I don't have anything more to add there just to finish the chapter, that chapter off. But just in case, because I was talking to some of the men on Wednesday. Uh, I don't know, maybe, was it Wednesday? Yeah. And I, said, I think I said to some of you guys that sometimes people ask questions and they're not clear about what they're really asking to trip you over, you know, to make you like not be sure like you might answer one way but really the question they had formed was another way kind of like, like how the pharisees were trying to trip over christ you know christ would answer their questions but christ was always he always knew where their heart was he knew they were trying to trip him over he, he knew but i don't have that knowledge because i'm not god right someone might ask me a question i might give an answer thinking that's the question the, the answer they were looking for but really they meant something else by that that question i don't know so just in case just in case someone accuses hold on kevin you know, you've emphasized faith, you've emphasized believing, and now you're saying you've also got to call upon the name of the Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord again is your faith, is the expression of your faith. Okay, what's happened in your heart is being expressed through your mouth. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Just in case someone's saying, Kevin, you once said, I don't, I don't know, I'm just throwing that out there, okay? Because again, I, the Lord wants me to pr preach this. So I want to cover all my bases as much as possible. These are the tracks we've been using since the church launch. Okay? 
we've used the same tracks in 2016 when we had the Soul Winning Marathon. It was, the same, it was a little bit different, but the content was exactly the same. Let me just read to you what our track says very quickly. So once the gospel has been explained, it says this. Um, the choice is yours, heaven or hell. It is the most important decision you'll ever make. So the, the choice now we see, no, I will reject the gift of God, or yes, I will accept the gift of God. Then it says, let us help you word a prayer. Realize it's not mere words that save. So again, we're not saying it's just say these words and that will save you. It's not the mere words that save, but your faith in Jesus Christ. We emphasize the believing. We emphasize the faith. All right? Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and deserve hell, but I believe you died on the cross for me and rose again to pay for my sins. Please save me right now and give me eternal life. I'm only trusting in you, Jesus. Amen. That's what we've always had in our tracks. Since the church launched, since 2016, when we went to the Soul Winning Marathon, okay? Now, just in case, my sending church, the church that ordained and sent me, the church in Punchbowl, has this on their tracks. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. If you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved forever. God cannot lie, and this is his unchanging promise to anyone who asks him. A simple prayer might sound like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell, but I believe you died for my sins and rose again. I now trust you alone to save me from hell. Please give me your gift of eternal life. Amen. Have I differed from my sending church? I've not differed, right? I'm not changing. You know, I've done this before. When I preached on repentance, I, I showed you from my previous churches that I've not changed my position on repentance from what that church was teaching before. Okay, I've not changed that. And I showed you proof from that. I read from their websites. I read from their statement of faith and so on and so forth. I'm doing the same thing right now. What about the church that sent my church? That's, no, sorry, the church that sent the church that sent me. Lighthouse Baptist Church, right? Ordained Victor, sent him to start the church in Punchbowl. What about that church? What do they teach on this topic? This is what I found on the website. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. If you will simply receive God's gift of eternal life by trusting the Lord Jesus to save you and calling upon his name, you can now know for sure that you are going to heaven. Won't you trust Jesus today? Bow your head and pray this simple prayer. Dear Jesus, I know I am a guilty sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell for my sins. I trust you now as my personal saviour and call upon you to save me from hell and take me to heaven. Amen. Okay? Now, what about the church that I was baptised in? The church that I got married in? Okay? What about that church? Okay, I got baptised in that church, meaning I believe the gospel that was being taught in that church. What's on their website? Southland Baptist, they're called now. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God has promised that if you will confess your sin to him, trust him alone to save you from your sinful condition, and ask him to save you, he will. You can make that decision today by praying from your heart something like this. Dear God, I know that I am separated from you because of sin. I confess that my sin, that in my sin I cannot save myself. Right now I turn to you alone to be my saviour. I believe that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. I ask you to save me from the penalty of my sin and I trust you to provide eternal life to me. Amen. What about the church that I spent nine years in? that I served two years as a deacon, that I preached for some four or five years in, served as a Sunday school teacher. What about that church? Right? The church my kids were born in and grew up in as children. Victory Baptist Church. This is what's on their website. Receive Christ by calling upon Him right now. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They all use the same reference. Romans 10, 13. Or was it Romans 10, Romans 10, 13? Are they all the same? I think they are. Romans 10, 13. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner in your sight and need Christ as my saviour. I now trust his death as the payment for my sins and call upon him to save me and give me the gift of eternal life. Amen. Are, they, are, are all these churches consistent? Have I changed or something? Am I preaching something that's brand new? What's going on? Right? It's the same. And look, I'm not quoting these churches because I base my doctrine on a church. I taught from the Bible at the beginning. I'm just showing you that, hey, we've not deviated from what we teach on the gospel. 
What about Pillar Baptist Church? Right? We've been invited to go soul winning with this church. Right? What do they believe? Pray and ask Jesus Christ to save you. It's on their tract. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.9 If you believe that Christ paid for your sins, then all you have to do is call out to him for salvation. Just admit or confess that you are a sinner in need of a saviour and ask him to save you. Let us help you word a prayer. Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and condemned to hell. I believe that you died on the cross, were buried and rose from the grave to pay for my sins. Please save me and take me to heaven when I die. Amen. Even the churches we've worked with believe the same. Call in upon the name of the Lord. Please, if I haven't explained something clearly or I've confused you further, I really want this to be understood. I wanna, we need to be on the same page here. Okay, we need to be on the same page. When you go and you see souls saved, I want you to have heard them acknowledge God in some way, shape or form. Not you, okay? Not just you. Yeah, I believe that. Let just, hey, look, is it unreasonable? Am I asking for something totally unreasonable here? That we would expect them to say something. And if they don't say something, don't count them as saved, okay? Don't count them as saved. Now, could they be saved? Yes. Could they close the door and just, there, Lord Jesus, save me? Yeah. Could they have just confessed that in their heart? Yeah. In fact, there's a, a recent time preaching the gospel. The woman wanted to receive Christ. I said, okay, you know, I can lead you in prayer if you want. She said, okay. And then I started praying. She didn't repeat. She didn't repeat. So, and then she's like, oh, I'm really embarrassed. I'm like, well, you know, she said, can I pray from my heart? I said, like quietly. She goes, yeah, okay. I said, all right. It's, and then so I prayed, I gave a moment to sort of pray from my heart. Again, you know, I, be, I believe she got saved, okay, because she was the one that wanted to pray with her heart. But did I count her as a saved person? No, I didn't, because I want to have consistency in the way we do this, right? She could very well be saved. God knows, right? We we'll rejoice in heaven when we know for sure. But I did not hear that, and in order just for the consistency in this church, so there's no confusion, so we're on the same page, so that we can walk together as a church, then, you know, I didn't count that as saved. And please, the same, do the same thing. You know, there's another guy, a week and a half ago, I asked him, do you want me to lead you in prayer? And I think this might even be the first time the guy goes, no, I'd rather just pray by myself. And I thought, oh, okay, he's gonna, you know, I don't know. And then right in front of me, dear Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Out of his own mouth, I didn't have to, repeat, you know, he didn't have to follow my words. It was a bit rough. It wasn't exactly the way I would have, but hey, it came from his heart. It came out of his mouth. I could hear that. I could, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Testify of the fact that this man had called upon the name of the Lord. And he, he didn't really say it quite right. He was, but he obviously said that, you know, he was putting his faith all on Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. That was enough for me. Okay? However you say it. However you say it. I'm not, I'm, and then you got some people, and look, I'm going over time. You got some people that say this. Well, if you didn't ask and you just thanked Jesus, then you're not really saved. Right? If you, instead of you going, Jesus, please save me, you, instead, like if someone says, Jesus, thank you so much for dying on the cross for my sins. I receive you now as my Savior. You know, thank you, you know, um, for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, no. He didn't ask. He didn't. Do you really think that man's going to get to heaven and God's going to say, you know, oh, well, did you ask me for it? <laughs> you only thanked me for it. You know, you only thanked me for the. And then you've got those that say, well, if you ask, and you're not going to... I heard this on YouTube. Some guy, what's his name? Robert Breaker. Robert Breaker, hyper-dispensationalist guy. Well, don't ask, because it's like God's given you the gift, and, you know, it's like... Let me, let me, let me uh, give you an example. Uh, Paris, here's the gift. Now ask me for it. No, nah, I'm giving it to you. Why are you asking? I'm giving it to you. See? And you're not saved because you're asking for something that's already been given to you. You know, I just, I don't know where people come up with these things. <laughs> just too much time in their hands. Go and preach the gospel and get people saved. Let's pray.